to give you now just a little bit of background information on the Oxford group, who they are, what they believed in, uh, probably the best way to do that is to give you a very brief biography of its founder, and that was a man by the name of Frank Bookman. And Bookman was a Lutheran minister in Pennsylvania, and uh, essential parts of his story go like this. Uh, he uh, was running a uh, home for young men in the Philadelphia area, and he had a visit from his board of directors uh, one evening, and they said to him, Frank, you're spending too much money uh, on these guys with the food bill. Could you please cut it down? And Frank, uh, like maybe some of us, had a big ego, and uh, he got angry, and he basically stormed out uh, of the room, quit his job, uh, was codependent, so he borrowed money from his parents, and he went on a tour of Europe. He was actually going to a conference there in a, in a town called Keswick, England. And what he learned from the resentment that he developed uh, between himself and those six men on the board is actually the beginnings of the, of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, maybe a, a way to help you get an appreciation of that and of what he learned, uh, we just do a little work here on the board. Uh, what, what Bookman knew was he had anger between himself and in this case, those other, pe those other six men. There was blockage. He was uh, isolated from them, angry with them, resentful with them. And as he went around England on his way to this uh, conference, what he recognized was to the degree that he was cut off from these people, to that very same degree he was cut off from God. In the liter A literature, they talk about the sunlight of the Spirit. Well, the sunlight of the Spirit could not get through to Frank Bookman. It was closed off. And he had an experience. The experience was uh, basically a surrender experience, where he went into a little chapel, got down on his knees, and he surrendered. Basically, what we would call in AA circles, step three. He then went and he wrote a letter of amends to the people who were on that board. Uh, and as he wrote the letter, what he noticed was, as he's letting go of this resentment, a flow starts coming into him from here. And this, this was really the essential ingredient of the, the contribution that, that he made. And it may sound small now, but it's really phenomenal because he saw this as the model for changing the world. He got together with a, a young man the next day who uh, was at the conference, and he told him what happened to him. And he asked, do you have anything like that in your life? And the guy said, well, yes, I do. And as he shared it, that guy started getting right right with God. And, you know, if this is throwing you at the beginning, and it's always, it's always good to kind of pause. I, I, had, a, I had a dear uh, teacher uh, in recovery who uh, struggled with this word. And the truth is nobody understands this word. If you think you understand God, um, you're kind of delusional. <laughs> we are incapable of understanding God. But we are, uh, we are quite capable of experiencing and this fellow had all sorts of terrible things done to him in the name of God. And what he did when he came into the program was instead of just writing God, he put another O in there and wrote good. And I think that man was probably more accurate and in touch with, with what, what is essential to recovery. It is that goodness is flowing through us, that that spirit of recovery is flowing through us. That, and that is the change, that is the death of the ego that we spoke about uh, a little bit earlier. So uh, what, you, what you see here is a, um, a connection um, to, um, 
to the, to the world, to changing the world, to what your role is in the world, and it's all based on your spiritual condition. When Bill Wilson came along, uh, he got sober in the Oxford group, and what he did was a, he attempted to capture the essence of the Oxford group program and write them into a series of steps. And the 12 became the number that he landed on. The Oxford group people never had steps, but they did have a program, they did have a process. And theirs kind of broke down into this. Uh, the first part of the process was connection. And that really became the first three steps, to connect the self to something beyond the self. All right? To connect it, one, two, three. The rest, or the ma na major part of the program now becomes this. Correction. What is it that is blocking this flow which Bookman believed ought to be natural? It ought to happen. His question is, why is it not happening? In his case, it was because of the hatred that he held in his heart for those six guys. And when he let go of that, he began to experience it. The last three, so this is, this is what? This is four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. This is where we make the correction, the change. Make a list of the people who are harmed, share that with another person. This becomes, uh, Wilson was asked, where did you put the central ingredient to, uh, to the, the Oxford Group program, which was honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. Those, those are the four absolutes. He said, they were, he's asked, where did you put them? He said, I put them in six and seven. I put them in six and seven. So this is where we're really willing to change at a huge level, to let go of everything that gets in the way. Okay? And then eight and nine, uh, we make amends. The last three steps had to do with receiving direction, and that's 10, 11, and 12. 10 is it taking daily inventory, 11 is the prayer and meditation practice that we're going to talk about in just a moment. And then 12 is the action as I carry that out into the world. Pretty soon, alcoholics began coming to the Oxford group uh, in the 1930s because they needed to change. They weren't so interested in changing the world like Bookman was. They were interested in changing themselves, changing their, their own lives. So what happens is uh, Roland Hazard helps a man by the name of Ebby to get sober. Ebby then carries the message to Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson carries the message to Dr. Bob. And down the chain of events, it goes to where we have two to three million people now uh, working uh, some variety of the 12-step programs. The thing that I learned in, in doing my studies about the Oxford Group and early AA practices came down to this. In uh, 1938, uh, people in AA were trying to, uh, to get some money from uh, J.D. Rockefeller uh, for this new program that they had. And Rockefeller sent a man by the name of Frank Amos to study it, examine it. Uh, it wasn't even called Alcoholics Anonymous like that, but he was looking at the people who got sober in Akron and New York and saying, what's happening here? What's going on here? And the report that he brought back, and this is reported in Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, uh, basic AA literature, that the members of that time did not consider meetings necessary to maintain sobriety. Now that's going to sound like heresy today, okay? Meetings, they believed, was not what was necessary. They were helpful. They were good. But they said in his report, morning devotion and quiet time, however, were musts. This is, this is not something that's optional. This is something that if you want to have that transformational effect in you, quiet time is the way it's going to happen. 